doing that. That was fantastic. So, Would you uh, pray with me as we go to God's Word together today? Father, we thank you so much for uh, this time of the year. We prayed with the worship team before the service, you know, Lord, and just, uh, just thank you for uh, a time of year where we can focus in on the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, where we can remember what you've done for us. We thank you for even today's weather and for the reminder of uh, purity that comes with snow, for the reminder of what it is that you can do in our lives for fresh starts. And Lord, I know that there are are some who will walk through these doors today, and that's what they need. They need a fresh start with you. There's some today who are walking in here, and they need encouragement. They need to hear from you. They need uh, you to speak to their lives today, God. There are others uh, today, Father, who uh, are dealing with um, just major life change and decisions in their life and need your guidance and your direction. And Lord, there are people Uh, in all sorts of various places this morning. And so we just pray that your Holy Spirit would have freedom in this church today, that you would speak to our hearts, that, God, you would get me out of the way so that you can do your work, that you would speak through uh, your powerful word. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, if you have a favorite uh, book of the Bible. When I was growing up, uh, there were several books of the Bible that my parents would regularly quote from that were kind of favorites of mom and dad Schulenberg. And when I got old enough to begin reading the Bible and begin to understand it and begin to apply it to my life, I found that uh, the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Rome, the book of Romans, uh, was my favorite book. I just loved it. I loved uh, reading it. I loved digesting it. It was kind of one of those first books of scripture that just came alive. I had a youth pastor in high school who uh, taught through the book of Romans, and uh, which is a tough thing to do with high school students, and made it come alive and uh, was something that was so exciting to me. It's a book that's impacted my life, my theology, and my worldview perhaps more than any book I've read. And if you've been reading the challenge and you've been keeping along with us all year long, you've been in the book of Romans toward the last part of this week. Today, you'd find yourself in Romans 11, 12, and 13, and tomorrow you'll finish the the book of Romans. It is uh, 16 chapters. The Protestant uh, Reformation can trace its roots back to the study of this book. In fact, Martin Luther attested to the fact that the Reformation didn't begin with the nailing of those 95 theses upon the Wittenberg Wittenberg door. It happened with the study of Romans chapter 1 in a study in a monastery where uh, he was a monk. In fact, it was Romans 117, to be specific, that shook Martin Luther to the core. He read this verse over and over and over again. It says, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And Martin Luther had grown up for years trying to live a holy life. The teaching of the day and the teaching for about four to five hundred years of church history that preceded Martin Luther talked about the fact that um, you needed to live a life that was perfect. The theology that he'd been taught pointed out to him his continual shortcoming and he was convinced that he would be under God's furious wrath because he was never good enough. And the study of the book of Romans and this verse in particular just began to um, embed itself in his mind. And Luther um, began to study the relationship between faith and grace and began to understand that salvation was a work of God upon a person's life, that salvation was God placing his righteousness upon us, that we could never be good enough to measure up to the standards of God, that it took Jesus Christ, that salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone was the way to come into a relationship with God. And it shook the church to its core. There's many a seminary professor who will tell you that the book of Romans is the, simply the greatest theological work ever written. And I agree with that. As you read through the book of Romans, and if you've been reading it again this week, you've read chapters 1 through 10 at least. Maybe you've been in chapter 11 this morning. Chapters 1 through 11 of Romans are just solid theology. It is just this jam-packed 
theological principle after theological principle. I mean, this is the meat of Scripture. The Apostle Paul talks about to some churches, he says, hey, you're not ready for the meat. You need to have the milk of the Word because you, you aren't mature enough to handle the meat. To the, book, to, to, the, to the church at Rome, he gave them meat. And the, the book of Romans has these huge theological principles that are talked about. Principles like justification by faith or progressive sanctification or our helplessness apart from God's salvation and so much more. And in Romans, you have these great theological chapters that are too much to take in in one reading. It's really unfortunate sometimes when you're trying to read through the Bible in a year and you come upon a chapter like Romans 3 that you could just spend you know, a month on just that chapter alone. And to try to just read that quickly, uh, you just scratch the surface. So you could literally study this book for years and years and years. You could write a doctoral thesis at the finest seminary in the land, and you'd still just scratch the surface on Romans. In my office, I have a number of commentaries that are written in particular books of the Bible. And, and I've got a, a shelf for the book of Romans that, that is bigger than any other commentary set that I have. I, I've had pastors throughout the years, these wonderful godly mentors in my life, older pastors who said, hey, I want to give you some of my books. And I treasure these, these books on Romans that they've given to me that are 100 years old, 125 years old. And they're, they're just these precious, precious volumes on theology. So Paul in Romans one through eleven just just packs theology in to the book at Rome to, to the church at Rome, and then in Romans twelve, he does something beautiful. He he just moves from this deep theology to the so what <laughs> to say hey here's the here's how you live your life now in light of everything that I've taught you in Romans one through eleven in light of all of this knowledge that you have about what it means to be a follower of God now this is how you live this is the practical stuff. And so if you want some of the most practical teaching in Scripture, look at Romans 12 through 16. These few chapters in Romans are, uh, include some of the, the greatest instruction on living ever written. Listen to how the, the chapter starts. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Could you spend like a month just on those two verses? I mean, could you spend some time saying, Lord, how am I doing here? How am I doing when it comes to being somebody who cares a whole lot more about what you say about me than what the world says about me? I mean, this whole idea of being people who don't conform to the world is really tough in the society in which we live, where we're continually uh, challenged to be people who go with the flow. When I was a college student at Liberty University in Virginia, a group of resident assistants uh, were invited to visit a church in Ohio for the weekend. There was a youth pastor at this church who had been an RA at Liberty, and he said, hey, I, wanna, I want a bunch of the RAs to come out and just be the youth pastors for my kids this week. And so we went to this giant church in Ohio, a number of us, to do this weekend service project with the youth ministry at this church. And since I was the pastoral ministries major in the group, they said, hey, will you preach the lesson, teach the lesson to these students? And I had never spoken in front of a group of students before in my life. And so I remember just shaking, you know, as we prepared to go to this church, which I had heard so much about because it was this incredible, incredible church that five friends had gone to plant together and God had just blessed in, in wonderful ways. And so as I prayed, Lord, what should I share with this group? Romans 12, 1 and 2 were the verses that just came to mind. And I remember speaking to these 60 junior or senior high students about uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2. And I, I preached it out of the King James Version, which I just love how the King James Version does Romans 1, 12, 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren... I love saying that to junior and high school students. I beseech you, therefore, brother. And I had this southern accent at the time, too. I had picked it up as a Liberty student. My daughter is coming home from college next week, and, uh, and, uh, and she, she's kind of picked up the Ohio accent. I, I completely picked up the Virginia accent. So I said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reason to black to serve. I mean, I was into it, all right? I mean, I, they were mesmerized, I'm sure. And then I said, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. 
And I don't remember anything I told the students that day, but I remember God worked in my heart that day as I shared from Romans 12, 1 and 2. I mean, I love those words I beseech from the King James Version because you just got this picture of the apostle talking to this church or writing to this church that he had never seen. He'd never met the people in Rome. He was longing to see them, couldn't wait to get to Rome, had heard so much about their faith. And yet he's saying, hey, listen, in light of everything I've told you, I'm begging you, live your lives this way. These words from Romans 12 are so precious. In our NIV Bibles, it begins with the word therefore. Therefore, I urge you, brethren. I had a preaching professor in seminary who would tell us uh, as future preachers, every time you see the word therefore in the Bible, you need to go back and see what it's there for, all right? And so there's your homiletical clue today for you as you read God's word. What is it there for? Again, what Paul's saying is, I've just given you doctrine 101, and based upon everything you've heard to this point, based upon the theology lessons that I've given you, based upon God's righteousness being placed upon you, this is how you ought to live. And then Paul just goes, For six chapters, he just pours in to the church at Rome. This is how the people of God live. This is how you relate to each other. This is how you relate to God. This is how you relate to government. This is how you relate to your employers. This is how you live in relationship with your your family. This is what it means to have liberty as followers of Jesus Christ. This is what it means to live a life that pleases others and not ourselves. This is what it means to be a servant. This is what the, 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 the servant living that Jesus talked about. And this is how you live it out in this generation. I want to tell you that the words from Romans 12 through 16 are as relevant to you living in 2012 as they were to that first century church in Rome. If you have not followed along whatsoever this year in the challenge, we are almost done. And we're going to be doing a number of great series next year. Pick up the reading of Romans this week. It is this incredible gift that God has given to you uh, this year. Verse 1 shows us how to live our lives as it relates to God. We're to be living sacrifices. People in the first century understood what that meant a whole lot better than we do. None of you have ever come to Woodbury Community Church with an animal that you're going to present on an altar for sacrifice. Uh, You know, and and really in the church of Rome, if people had done that, it was because they were Jewish folk who had transferred to Rome and they were continuing in the traditions that they had in Israel Or there were some who were coming out of pagan rituals where sacrifice was a part of their religion as well. But there was this beautiful picture that Paul said when he says, hey, listen, I want you to present your bodies to God as living sacrifices. It was this idea that, you know, when, when, when a sacrifice was given at the altar, it was dead. I mean, it it was alive, but it, it was killed and there was no getting off the altar. A living sacrifice has the ability to get off the altar. A living sacrifice, it's this act of the will that says, God, I'm yours, and I'm staying in your will, and I'm living my life for you. Rick Warren, in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, which is celebrating its like 10th year anniversary this year, began the book with these famous words, it's not about you. And that's what we need to understand when it comes to living our lives as as sacrifices for God. Our lives are about God. And so Romans 12, 1, practical living Christian life begins with our relationship with God. And verse 2 then shows how we live our lives in relationship to the rest of the world. Kind of works really well with that love God, love others, make disciples that we talk about here all the time. And in verse 2, Paul shows us that Christ followers don't conform to the world's standards. We conform to God. The only way to make it in this world as a follower of Jesus Christ is to allow God to transform us through the renewing of our minds that happens through the Word of God. And that's what's been so precious about the challenge this year for those who've been able to do that. Romans 12, 3 through 8 is just practical teaching on spiritual gifts and the gifts that God has given us. But I want to skip ahead to verse 9. Because in verses 9 through 10, we see, again, how Christ followers are to relate to one another. Uh, One pastor called these the Ten Commandments of the New Testament on how Christians relate to each other. And number one is this, that we're to love one another. Romans uh, 12, 9 and 10, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, 
cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. You know, I love these verses. Last week, if, if you were with us, you'll remember we talked about 1 Corinthians 13. It's that great love chapter of the Bible. So we spent a, a lot of time talking about love last week. Paul uses the same Greek word, agape, here as he uses in 1 Corinthians 13 when he tells us that our love for each other needs to be sincere. We're to embrace the qualities of love described in 1 Corinthians 13. Christians love without hypocrisy. It's the real deal. True love is going to shun evil. It's going to seek the best for the other person. It is that relentless pursuit of the lifting up of others that we talk about regularly here. Paul tells us that we should be devoted to one another in brotherly love, too. And so we move from agape love, this perfect divine love, to the Greek word philos, which is brotherly love, which, you know, we get the city of Philadelphia. The city of brotherly love is, 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 is named after this Greek word philos. There's this love that is willing to lay aside our own desires for the desires of another. I love an illustration that Darren Hunt, a pastor from Pennsylvania, shared with his church on this. He said Carol was this wonderful clerk in her town at a Christian bookstore that um, often referred to the church as the body. And when she talked about the church, it was always the body, the body of Christ this, the body of Christ that. And so one week, many devoted members of the local body had come to the bookstore to buy birthday gifts for their pastor. And on Saturday of that week, the pastor of that church, John, stopped by the Christian bookstore. And he told Carol about the surprise party that his congregation had given him the night before. And Carol's heart was touched, and spontaneously she leaned forward and exclaimed, Oh, John, I just love your body. <laughs> there were scandals all across that town that day. Now, the body of Christ is this beautiful thing that we ought to love, and it's this thing that we serve each other. True fellowship means that we love each other. Okay, second commandment for Christians that Paul gives here is that we're to honor one another. We relate one another by honoring each other. Look at the end of verse 10. Honor one another above yourselves. You want good advice today? Paul, I mean, he's just so full of practical advice. Here's some great advice. Honor other people. Show them esteem. Show them that they are valuable. Look for opportunities to talk other people up. Congratulate other people when they accomplish something. Seek advice from others. Defer to others. I don't know about you, but people that I enjoy hanging out with are people that understand what it means to honor other folks. In the original language, this verse would have literally been translated, lead the way for others in honor. Lead the way for others in honor. In other words, Christians, Paul's talking to the church at Rome, church at Rome, your leaders, <clears throat> you ought to be leading the way in showing others esteem. Remember, each person on planet earth has been created in the image of God. Every one of you bear the image of your maker. So do you treat other people that way? Do you treat other people as if they are precious in the eyes of God? I was reading uh, something this week, and I can't remember where. I wish I could find the source. It was a, a pastor who was talking about when he preaches to his congregation. And uh, he had had a particularly frustrating week. And, um, and there, I think it was in a blog somewhere, and some people were making comments, and he said, listen, every time I stand in front of the pulpit and my, con and, and my congregation is before me, he says, I try to remember that each person there is precious to God that they are created as in his image with great dignity and value and worth. And that pastor had it right. How do you see the people in your life? How are you actively pursuing honoring them? At Christmas time, it's not uncommon for people to go to a homeless shelter. When I was the youth pastor at Wooddale Church, we would bring our high school students uh, every Christmas time to go visit the Salvation Army Shelter and Catholic Charity Shelter in downtown Minneapolis. They're right next to each other. And we would go on a December night and we would bring uh, bag lunches, bag meals for the guys. We'd bring warm socks for the men and the women who were in the shelters. And then we'd engage in conversation. And we'd spend about an hour talking with the men at the shelter. And I was always blessed as I watched the children of these Eden Prairie millionaires many of them who had never experienced a difficult day in their life financially, talking with men and women whose entire lives had fallen apart. And many of those students would walk in and they were judgmental, 
I mean, they'd, they'd be saying it's their problem. It's they, they got involved in drugs or they got involved in crime or they're, they're, they're there because of some reason. And many of them had these prejudgments on the homeless in our city. And as these students listened to the stories, they often found themselves drawn to the individuals. And they found that some of their preconceptions about what homelessness is all about and why these men and women are homeless um, just weren't true. Sure, there were some who were there because of drugs and alcohol and crime, but there were many who had just fallen upon terribly tough times and had no one to whom they could turn. I watched as these children would honor the men and women as they listened to their stories, and then I'd listen to them as they'd listen to the advice that the homeless would give to the children of the millionaires. And it blew me away. Blew me away as I'd listened to this great wisdom from somebody who was sleeping on a mat in a shelter. We honored them on those nights. We need to recognize that all people are worthy of honor. The third instruction I'm relating to other believers is that we're to worship with one another. Look at verses 11 and 12. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. These verses speak of different aspects of true worship. True believers make worship a priority in their lives and they recognize that worship in the context of community is a good thing. They recognize too that everything is spiritual. How we parent, the way we relate to our spouse, the work that we do, how we treat our neighbor, how we handle our finances and spiritual activities. And read through the book of Romans and you're going to see Paul continuing to build the case for that in the chapters that follow. In our lives, we'll have many opportunities to serve the Lord, many times that we're going to need hope in the midst of affliction. We'll have many times that um, we don't know what to do. And Paul is saying, listen, all of it needs to be undergirded in prayer. If prayer isn't a part of body life, if prayer isn't a part of the lives of believers living together, then we have fallen so short. We are to be faithful in prayer. David Zeal was a junior high boy when I first met him. He was this gangly, geeky, awkward kid. I mean, he was, he was as awkward as it would come. My wife and I were living in Washington, D.C. at the time. We were candidating at a church in Illinois to be the new uh, youth pastor and spouse at this church. And I remember meeting David and three other boys just like him on the candidacy weekend. And the church wanted us to have an opportunity to hang out with some kids in kind of a non-threatening way that weekend and see how we'd relate to them, I suppose. And so Dave was one of the students that we went to Pizza Hut with that week. He, I'll never forget, he took the entire uh, thing of, of hot peppers and put it on top of his Pizza Hut pizza and dared the rest of the guys to eat it that night. He was um, this kid who immediately wanted to in- exchange email addresses with me. And one of the things that I was struck with with Dave was just this, this zeal that he had. I mean, he was this kid who just embodied, even as a junior higher, verse 11, never be lacking in zeal. And you know, you wonder when you meet a kid like that, is it going to stick? Are they going to continue to be people who are passionate about the Lord? I mean, I think about that with Monty too. I mean, Monty's one of these people who just, I mean, he says the zeal for the Lord, it just oozes out of him. And when Dave gave me his email address, he says, so my email address is zftl at aol.com. I said, okay, what does ZFTL stand for? It stands for zeal for the Lord, because my last name's Zeal, and I have zeal for the Lord. And then he tells me, you know, um, that it's based on Romans 12, 11. He was one of the wisest young men I ever met. I mean, he was one of these kids who I learned more from him than he learned from me. And when the Evangelical Free Church, the denomination I was serving at the time, the youth ministry office sent an email to all the youth pastors and said, hey, we're going to do this mission trip, and we'd love like the best leaders from every church in our denomination to be a part of it this summer. Do you have any kids you'd recommend? I recommend Dave. And Dave uh, said to me, really? You think I should go overseas? And I'm scared of bugs. I don't like to fly. I mean, I, but, it, but if you think I should, I mean, if you think that's something I should do, I'll pray about it, and I'll get back to you on it, PB. That's what he called me. And I said, all right, thanks, Dave. <laughs> Um, and so he prayed about it and, uh, he came back to me like two weeks later cause he took his time to pray about the decision. He says, I really think I'm supposed to go on that mission trip. So he went on this mission trip to South America. He was deathly afraid of the bugs, deathly afraid of the travel, didn't speak a word of Spanish. And today he's serving as a missionary in Costa Rica and his zeal still shines. But that was a decision that he made even as a young man. A decision that said, hey, zeal for the Lord is something that you have to work at. It's something, you know, that, that Paul says later on that we're, we're to work out our salvation with 
fear and trembling. I mean, we, we have to work at this. And working at it in the context of worshiping together is a beautiful thing. We need the body. The body's beautiful. Fourth lesson, I'm relating to one another. We need to be generous with one another. Look at verse 13. Share with God's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Did you know that generosity has always been at the core of the Christian church? Listen to how Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47, describes the body life of the early church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. But listen to this verse. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This was a church that practiced so many things. Generosity amongst them. When someone in the body had a need, they met that need. And Paul is adamant that we share with those who have need, that we practice hospitality. In fact, he's so adamant about this that he says, hey, if you're going to be a church leader later on, he says, you need to be somebody who practices hospitality. When he was giving instruction to a young pastor named Timothy about what the elders in his church should look like, in 1 Timothy 3, 2, he said, amongst the practices of elders is that elders ought to be people who display hospitality. You can't be a leader of others without being somebody who's hospitable, who's generous. I like something that Robert Shannon writes about this passage. He says that Paul is speaking about the word koinonia. Christian fellowship is so unique that the first believers searched for a word to describe it, and they couldn't find one. So they found the solution in an old word that was no longer in use at the time that the New Testament days were taking place. They dusted off that word and they used it the word koinonia, they knew no ordinary word could describe the relationship that existed among believers. No ordinary word could describe the relationship that existed amongst believers. Wouldn't it be great if that was said about Woodbury Community Church? There's not an English word that could describe what it's like to be at Woodbury Community Church. I mean, these people love each other. They're passionate about each other. They're involved in each other's lives. I mean, they're not meddlers. They're just, they just they love each other. They genuinely care. There's this fellowship, this, this and again, they just had to use this word koinonia because it was the closest word they could have that uh, in, in the ancient text sort of described what it meant to have the type of relationship that those in the early church had. Number five, love your enemies. And in a few passages here, in a few verses in Romans 12, he talks about this. We're going to skip a little bit. Look at verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Look at the beginning of verse 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. And then 19 and 20. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Talk about going against unconventional wisdom. When you get down to it, loving your enemies is the only way we can interpret these words. And it's how Jesus Christ lived his life. And Paul was so acquainted with that. I mean, if anybody was an enemy to the gospel, it was Saul, the man who was on this murderous rampage to kill Christians. He was an enemy of God. And yet God reaches out to him with love and grace. Jesus is this person who was ridiculed again and again, mocking and beaten, betrayed by those he loved, and yet he died for all of those who put him on the cross. Our God is the ultimate example of loving your enemy. When we choose to not exact revenge upon those whom we could rightfully lash out at, we imitate Christ. It takes a mature believer not to follow through on the right that we might feel to make somebody feel the pain that they've made us feel. And I can't tell you how much it breaks my heart as a pastor when I hear Christians who want to exact revenge upon the people in their lives who have hurt them. But if anybody should know different, it's us. 
We ought to be the people who are reflecting Christ's character. It's one of those marks of a mature believer that we love our enemies. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. knew a thing or two about what it meant to have enemies and people who, who didn't appreciate him. There were many who marched with Dr. King that questioned how he could treat his enemies with such dignity. And King was fond of saying, I have decided to stick with love, for hate is too great a burden to bear. Some great wisdom from him. It's too great a burden to bear between believers too. We need to do everything that we can to live at peace with one another. It's for, in verse 15 that we learn our next lesson. We need to experience life with one another. Mature believers experience life with one another. Paul put it this way, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. And otherwise, we, in other words, we, we empathize with each other. We're people who um, aren't afraid to rejoice and to celebrate with others in those moments of celebration. Sometimes our jealousy gets the best of us when good things happen to other people. And instead of enjoying what God has done for them, we, we get jealous. And it's this bitter and this, this ugly thing. There's a beautiful thing that happens when we can come alongside of those who are mourning too and genuinely mourn with them. Some of the greatest days of my life have been spent rejoicing with my friends when they rejoice. Some of the most bittersweet moments of my life have involved mourning with those who mourn. I'll never forget the morning early in my time here at Woodbury Community Church where a family in our small group had lost their son to death. And it was less than 12 hours from the time that that happened. I was preaching on Sunday morning, and I couldn't get the words out. I, I, I stood up here before you as this pastor who'd been with you for two months, and just like a blubbering baby just started crying, because I couldn't not. I was mourning with those who mourned. I mean, this, these were precious, precious people. I remember John Kimball coming up and putting his arm around me in, in a very mature way, showing this Christian love that says, hey, our pastor's mourning, but let's pray for him. And, you know, we got through it that morning, but it was hard. But there's also one of the most bittersweet moments in my life. I don't think I've ever quoted Robert Schuller. I don't know if I ever will again, but I really like this quote from Robert Schuller. He says, love is my decision to make your problem my problem. Love is my decision to make your problem my problem. Think about your life. Think about the times when you've been the one whose problem needs to become somebody else's problem. And what it has felt like to feel the sweet relief of somebody else coming alongside of you. And maybe it's been tough, and maybe it's been a challenge, but it's also this beautiful picture of what it means to live as Christians. All right, lesson number seven in our instruction for living is that we're to live at peace with others. Look at verses 16 and 18. Live in harmony with one another at the beginning of verse 16 and then verse 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. The Sunday after this year's elections, I mentioned that we're living in one of the most exciting times in history, and there were many of you who disagreed with me on that. And while many Christians that I know seemed ready to give up on any hope whatsoever because their candidate was not elected or their issue wasn't advanced, many recognize that the body of Christ has an unprecedented opportunity in our lifetime. And while we have a country today that is divided in a fiscal cliff that worries us and all sorts of things that are going on with politicians who can't agree with each other, the church doesn't have to live a fractured life. In fact, we can be so countercultural in this world. We can show the world what it means to be people who are different and maybe disagree with each other on issues and yet still love each other. We can be people who are a beacon of hope in a world that needs something this Christmas that others just don't have, that can show folks that living at peace with others is not only possible, but it is beautiful, and it happens regularly. And it's one of the things I love about this church. We have an opportunity to be a beacon in our community. Lesson number eight is found at the end of verse 16, and that is that mature Christians embrace humility. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Humility involves seeing others with the eyes of Christ. This verse carries with it the idea that sometimes we need to be, doing, be willing to do the things that nobody else wants to do. We need to be willing to hang out with the people that nobody else wants to hang out with. We need to humble ourselves. I remember a time in my ministry where I had to humble myself with a person that I just really didn't get along with. They didn't like me. I didn't like them. And they were uh, 
uh, we were volunteering together in the same ministry, and this just incident broke out where this guy was in a really awkward situation, and um, he needed somebody to step in and rescue him. And I didn't want to rescue him. I just wanted him to have to suffer with the awkward situation that he was dealing with that evening. But I felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit said, no, you need to serve him. And I wanted to say, but Lord, you don't know what he's been saying about me. You know how tough it is. You don't know the, 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 the backstabbing that's been going on. And, and all I could hear from the Lord that night was, you know how many times you've done that to me, Turkey? Now you get in there and you serve him. You get in there and you love him. And there was this beautiful opportunity to love somebody who had made my life miserable for months and months and months. And it absolutely transformed my relationship with him. We need to embrace humility. Philippians 2, 3 to 4 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. All right, lesson number nine. We're almost done. Embrace integrity. Look at the end of verse 17. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. Are you a person of integrity? Do you go out of your way to do the right thing rather than the easy thing? Are you seeking to represent Christ well in all that you do? You see, true believers embrace integrity and will fight to live it out. During his time as a rancher, Theodore Roosevelt and one of his cowpunchers lassoed a maverick steer. They lit a fire and prepared their branding irons. The part of the range that they were on was claimed by a man named Gregor Lang, one of Roosevelt's neighbors. According to the cattleman's rule, the steer therefore belonged to Lang. As this cowboy applied the brand, Roosevelt said, wait, that ought to be Lang's brand. We found that horse on his property. And the cowboy said, that's all right, boss. And Roosevelt said, but you're, you're putting on my brand, not Lang's brand. You need to put on Lang's brand. And the man said, no, no, it's all right. We're putting on your brand. I mean, he, he didn't know. And Roosevelt demanded, drop that iron and get back to the ranch and get out. I don't need you to work for me anymore. A man who will steal for me will steal from me. Our final lesson is that we are to be good to one another. Look at verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The command seems so simple. Don't let evil overcome you. Want to overcome the wickedness of evil? Then be good. It's a great summary of the rest of this chapter. Christ followers seek to overcome evil by doing good. And oftentimes there is this great light that is lit in a very dark place when one person will take a stand for righteousness, when one person will stand alone, when one person will do what Paul says that we were supposed to do in verses 1 and 2, when one person will say, I'm going to offer my body as a living sacrifice, I am no longer going to be conformed to the standards of this world, but I'm going to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. You see, when we allow God to get a hold of us, we're able to overcome evil. We're able to do good. We're not able to do any good in and of ourselves apart from God's Spirit working in us. I hope that you'll take time this Christmas season, this week, to read through the book of Romans. And may you recognize what a gift we have in the Lord's instruction for our lives. Many people have called the Bible God's roadmap. They've called it just a map or, or um, kind of the guidebook in our life. I love this acronym. Many of you have heard it before. Bible. Basic instructions before leaving earth. That's what this book is for us. May we be people who treasure it this Christmas season. And parents and grandparents, here's my parentheses for you. Let this year be the year that you help your kids treasure it too. Help this book become alive. Do your kids and your grandkids think that you're any different than the rest of the world as it relates to this book? What, what role does this book have in your home? Is it something we just talk about on Sundays? Because I guarantee you, your kids are going to walk away from the faith someday. Your grandkids will walk away from the faith someday if this is just a Sunday academic exercise. If it has nothing to do with the rest of the week. Be people who make this... Um, and treasure this as the gift that it is for us. Let's pray. God, we love you. And boy, these instructions that you've given us are hard. But Lord, we know that they're impossible apart from your spirit working in us. So Lord, we invite you to do your work today. We thank you for the gift of your word. And we thank you for your work of transformation. In Jesus' name, amen.